Jackson's talk tonight is Startup Cash Flow Forecast. It's a projection, not a promise, with apologies to Patrick Valance, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to those watching online. Um, I feel like I'm speaking to a um, privileged and very special group, not because they're listening to me, but number one, you didn't have anything better to do than to come out and hear about cash flow. Number two, you sat down to these numbers, and if that didn't put you off, um, you, you, you suddenly realized there was an American going to be talking to you, and you stayed nonetheless. So I thank you very much. I'm in your debt. Um, the, to, this is titled because I, in my um, experience, I've had 170 startups that I've been honored to coach. I, I, I enjoy coaching. I feel, um, it sounds terrible, fulfilled coaching. I actually live through the little companies I coach. And one of the things that they particularly have trouble with when we get started is trying to project cash flow. The promise thing came out of people kept saying, well, what happens if it's wrong and how do I know? And I suddenly realized that maybe there were more honest people in the world than I thought because there were people who actually didn't want to fudge the figures. And so fearing the fudging, they wouldn't forecast at all. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We'll get to those sheets, um, which I'll also have up here so the audience at home won't feel like they're, they're left out. Um, and don't be intimidated by those. Um, it's simpler up here. Um, one rule I have is there's nothing worse than sitting and talking to somebody about something, particularly like cash flow. And if you're going to go through that agony, at least you should know why you might want to listen to them. I'm not saying when you're done with this, you still will, but this is my case for staying at least 40 more minutes. By the way, if I stay over, if I go over, uh, this, the, the campus here has all kinds of facilities, but if you're a speaker, you should know I'm reliably informed if you go over by more than 30 seconds what looks like an innocent intersection of panels actually opens, um, and you get a personal visit to the cesspool downstairs to remind you of the experience, and nobody's used it since the first time. So anyway, if you go on LinkedIn, and presuming you were really interested in what you were going to hear about tonight, you might have, LinkedIn um, holds me out to be a mentor. A mentor is somebody different than, than a consultant or a coach. I can mentor you in being a submarine officer because I have been a submarine officer. I cannot mentor you in being an astronaut, but I can coach you as an astronaut. So a mentor is sharing experience, coaching is um, helping someone else identify within themselves the best way to proceed. And when I started, um, my biggest problem 25 years ago was keeping my mouth shut because you cannot tell people the solution that you believe. That's a consultant or a mentor. As a coach, you have to draw it out of them. So I am a mentor in certain subjects, and yes, submarines, I, I, um, we have an all-volunteer system in the American Navy, and if you want to get into submarines, you have to volunteer. Um, and, but the minute you put in that I would like to go to a suddenly, as it was back then, the teletype comes and transfer Lieutenant Bean to submarine school with immediate effect, and bam, you're on the plane from Rome to New York to go start, because nobody want really gets into submarines unless they volunteer for it. Having said that, um, having been through university and studied business and s learned how it's supposed to go in the fantasy world, actually, there's no better place to learn leadership, and something I sometimes talk about is the difference between leadership and management, and there's a m huge difference. Um, in a submarine, if you're an officer, as I was, you'd better lead by m respect, not by the number of gold stripes on your arm, because there are guys in there with PhDs, and they have no gold, so you earn their respect. It also teaches teamwork. It's pretty obvious if somebody drowns on a submarine, we're all going to drown. So there are no heroes here, there are no people. And you'll actually find people quietly leaving the submarine if they're not part of the team. So I'm very team-oriented. Polymath I st stumbled on. Um, polymath just means you're interested and seem to know a little bit about all kinds of things. Um, and, th and I am. I'm fascinated by anything but particularly steam trains, engineering, and, and physics. I'm, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm fascinated by, as you go up through quantum physics, if you cross over the top, it almost starts to be in the secular world philosophy. And uh, to those of us who are Christians, um, it, it, it's religion almost. Uh, um, you're getting in touch. So that's, you can see how the, I started exhibiting the traits of a polymath. 
circumnavigator, I, I was always picked last in gym class, um, or I don't know what you call it here, but when they were going shirts and skins, shirts and skins, and they were getting two teams of football, basketball, baseball, or whatever, it didn't matter. Branson would be picked last, right? So that, and this has helped me as a coach because I, I, I have very low self-esteem still at age 68, and I also suffer from what a lot of people do, which is called the imposter syndrome. And that is, you can't even credit yourself with success because you believe that you're a fraud. And once these people that have promoted you or paid you or, or said you did a good job realize what an idiot you are, you'll be gone. And with me, if you want to embarrass me, hand me a baby, because I've never had kids, or throw me a ball, and you'll see I dropped it. So my solution to this was Che Blythe, for those of you who are Scottish, and a lot of the people in the UK know who he was, had a race for people like me, and it was known as the, the world's toughest yacht race, 33,000 miles down west through the Southern Ocean. Most races go the other way because the wind goes the other way. Um, and that proved to me that I was probably as good as those macho guys standing up at the bar who all they could talk about was rugby. And I actually found myself when I came back from that, pushing my way through those guys. I used to be intimidated by saying, excuse me, I want a drink. So that was the purpose of the circumnavigator. I did that only once, but I've sailed across the Atlantic under sail four times. Um, I put the Christian in the front first because it's true, but also because um, to the outside world, it's sort of interesting. I'm governed by a different or a special set of rules in, in what I am morally supposed to do. That's one impact of being a Christian business coach. Um, the, also, as a Christian business coach, I empathize with other Christian business people because if we follow the words of the Lord, we're not supposed to lie. And I was talking with a friend coming up who happens to be a lawyer, and I said, well, people who aren't Christians are really frustrated in the way they can negotiate because in negotiation, you always hear people say, that's the highest I could possibly pay. And then five minutes later, they pay double that. So what happened to the, that was the highest? Well, that, that's a common procedure in negotiating that actually to a Christian is a lie. The other thing is because Christians um, have a faith that governs their life, they have a few resources as a coach you can deal with. So I put that on there. Business means I, I, I help business people identify their business goals and then I help them identify what's standing between them and getting there. But I don't tell them what it is. I try to draw it out of them. In the audience are two or three people who have um, suffered through my uh, coaching. Um, I'm happy to say there have been 170 of them, um, and they'll probably refute everything I say tonight. But this is, um, and so the mic will mysteriously go off during the question time, and it'll be because too many of them are going to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, executives, sometimes people get in companies um, and they either want to go higher on, and, and want to go faster. Some companies offer executive coaching as a perk. Um, and some people um, are themselves are worried and they hire an executive coach. Leadership is just an extension of the same. As it relates to this, um, uh, um, I've been privileged to do actually over 170 startups. Um, I, I'm a consultant with Moore Stevens in the Isle of Man, and they have the contract um, to, to coach, and that's the job I do. And I also coach outside um, people around the world um, on Skype, maybe somebody like out there. Um, you, as you can tell from the accent, I wasn't born in Foxdale, um, but I have been here 37 years. I come from Laconia, New Hampshire, but moved here from Miami. Um, I have a business degree and also an engineering background, and the idea was I'm supposed to be able to talk to the engineers and the accountants, so that's why I feel a little bit comfortable what we're about to talk about, um, and get the place to make money. The Navy taught me leadership. I then went into sales. I used to sell office buildings, so long-term sales, um, 18 to 24 months to get a deal, straight commission. You have to monitor your sales funnel, which is another talk. Um, there, and that's where I learned how to sell. I went from there to Miami to work for a German publisher, um, and I did all his property troubleshooting, uh, going into projects, construction, sorting them out. Um, I had 300 employees, and that was a job I was probably too young for. Um, but somebody, again, imposter syndrome, thought I was doing okay, so they hired me, and I moved over here, and they paid the expense, so I fooled them long enough, see how it then works, to, to pay for me to come here. Overall, this 
overrides everything I do. Um, it is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man or woman can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. And it's definitely the thing that drives me in coaching is just seeing the look on the face when somebody flies and they thought they were going to crash. So this is probably what you've come to or think you're going to see. And if you sat in the chair, you can see confirmation thereof. But before we get there, and this is all very complex. And the point I'll make here, by the way, any accountant can do this. If you can't do this sheet, don't worry. You can hire an accountant to do that. The hard bit is the assumptions, and that's where you as the entrepreneur come in. How many are entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs? Mm, 20%. That's good. Um, the, what we'll be talking about tonight is trying to do this when you don't have any history. Um, it, it's like trying to estimate how fast you can get to the south of the island when you don't even know if you have a car or not, or how fast the one you'll get. That's the challenge of a startup. So let's just quickly go through the background. Um, by the way, don't worry if you miss a lot. Usually in I, when I give a talk, I um, try to um, encourage questions during. Um, but in the interest of not falling into that trap, um, I'll, we'll save the questions. There's 15 minutes at the end. We, and we can delve into the fine points at this. So don't worry. Try to get the concept, because it was the concept I learned after about 80 startups that was causing so much trouble with people understanding how or what uh, uh, is necessary to do a cash flow. Just to put it in perspective, and there's enough jargon in the world, there, there are th the holy trinity, if I can be somewhat sacrilegious, of the finance world is the income statement, profit and loss. Um, so you pr over here in the, in the UK, you hear profit and loss a lot. In, in this state, you'll hear income statement. Balance sheet, income measures profit, balance sheet measures what you really have and the statement of cash flow shows just the cash going and coming. There are two types of accounting, accrual and cash. The cash flow assumes that you're accounting for everything when the money hits. Now, if that, if that creates a problem in your mind, picture the guy. I'm a Boeing guy with my passport. You can't be Airbus. So when you sell a 747, sad time this week, BA got rid of all their 747. Anyway, Back when they were selling 747s, you would, might ink the deal today with somebody who's going to pay you three or four hundred million for the aircraft, but it's going to take 24 months before you actually deliver the aircraft. So something has happened at the start that's 350 million worth. At the end is only when you're going to get the 350 million in cash during those two years that it's being built, which is a slow build for a 747, but anyway, um, things are happening. If you're accounting only by cash that first day, unless they gave you a deposit, is zero, even though they signed a contract for 350 million. And then on the day that two years later, when they give you the check for the 350 under a cash basis, that's the only time anything happened except buying parts during the time. Under accrual, if you've satisfied everything, you can start to recognize the income well before you get the 350 million. I'd ask if there are any questions, but I'd screw things up and then I'd fall in there, so we'll save it to the end. But the whole idea is if the cash didn't pass through your bank account, it doesn't turn up on the cash flow. And the reason it's so important is try to pay your rent or try to pay for groceries, American again, with something other than cash. So this is, as we're about to see, is uh -oh. next slide. There is no next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> as we're about to, um, I'm probably, I'm, I'm technologically challenged. Um, so along with, along with those, those three um, basic statements that you'll find all the time in any financial situation. You'll also run into some things like revenue, which is sometimes referred to as top line. Sales, which sometimes looks like that and sometimes doesn't. And don't panic because we're not going to go there. I'm just trying to say that I'm trying to emphasize what you should focus on. Turnover is sometimes sales. Profit is something totally different. Uh, um, profit is what it, it, you have left to the good beyond what you've had to spend to get there. So profit's pretty obvious. 
but on a cruel basis, it doesn't mean you have any money to spend. You can actually go bankrupt in a high profit time, particularly if there's a growth, because you don't have the cash to sustain it. So the one, one thing entrepreneurs have to watch out for when it starts going is you'll actually outsell your ability to fund it. And suddenly you've got all these orders, you get all this work in process, and you've got tremendous profit and you go bankrupt. So that's an important point to remember when you're talking to your accountant, they say, good news is you're profitable. Always ask, how, do I, how am I for cash? And if you get nothing out of all this, remember those complicated sheets in, in the C can be interpreted and done by an accountant. It's the concept. So when the accountant says you're profitable, say, that's great. How do I look for cash? Okay? Repeat after me. How do I look for cash? Like it. Okay. So, and here's the reason. With all this and all this you can get an MBA with and so forth and so on. Um, as long as you know that we're talking, and I said talking because we're getting down d dirty and it's cash, because profits don't tell the whole picture. A company can find ways to make its earnings look better. And by the way, still be ter perfectly legal. But with cash flow, and there are several attorneys in the audience, so they'll, 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 or lawyers, sorry, forgot where I was, um, who will back me up on that. The firm's true well-being um, is with cash flow. So if you ain't talking cash, then we're probably not going to talk much more. So <clears throat> I'm not a great fan of Al Gore, but I, so I, but I stole this anyway. Cash is a, the real inconvenient truth. It sometimes surprises people to know that 81% of failed businesses didn't fail because they had no problems, uh, sales, didn't fail because the costs were out of control, they might have contributed. 81% failed because they just didn't have cash to continue. And that's why the other thing to remember is just watch the cash all the time because without it, I don't care how many sales you've got, I don't care how many contracts you've got, I don't care what a great deal you've got from the suppliers. If the cash isn't in the bank, you can't pay the rent unless the guy will take something different like tomatoes or potatoes or I don't know, okay? So, um, to, I'm, this is just a little thing I found in, it, the, the, this is a great thing I found, it's Investopedia, and there's gonna be a quick two minute chat that, that's gonna buzz through the whole concept and then I'll come straight back, okay? I hope, here we go. Cash flow refers to the movement of cash into or out of an account, a business, or an investment. When cash inflows exceed outflows, this is generally considered to be a sign of good financial health, both for individuals and companies. Ed makes his living running Ed's carpets. For Ed, cash flow is essential to the survival of his business, as well as his personal finances. Having ample cash on hand ensures that Ed can pay his employees, his creditors, and himself on time, keeping the business afloat. The same goes for Ed. He needs enough cash in his personal bank account to pay for his house, his car, and other personal expenses. Whether we are talking about Ed or his business, there are generally three types of cash flows. One, operational cash flows refer to cash received or spent as a result of a company's business activities. For example, a business like Ed's Carpets brings in cash by selling carpets and sends cash out to pay employees and suppliers. Similarly, Ed pays himself a salary, providing cash flow to his personal account. Cash will flow out to pay for his expenses, such as food and housing. Two, investment cash flows refer to cash received or spent through investing activities, basically the purchasing and selling of assets that will help grow the business, or in the case of Ed, assets that will help increase his net worth. Three, financing cash flows refer to cash received through debt or paid out as debt repayments. For a company, issuing stock, paying down debt, and repurchasing shares would count as part of financing cash flows. For Ed, financing cash flows include any cash coming from loans or other types of debt, as well as payments going to pay down debts. If Ed's business comes up short on cash and is unable to pay its obligations, it will experience a cash flow crunch. To avoid insolvency, Ed will have to arrange some type of financing or bridge loan. A similar situation in Ed's personal accounts would also have disastrous effects that could lead to personal bankruptcy if the cash flow crunch persisted. 
For this reason, it is important that businesses and individuals manage their cash flow carefully and set aside emergency reserves to cushion any unexpected events. Good. So that's like an overview, <clears throat> and I've blown a tremendous amount of time, and that's starting to open. Um, we just talked about questions. Generally, the rule amongst um, uh, uh, successful entrepreneurs is they ask themselves three questions that's basically more specific than the question I just said. You should every morning ask yourself, if, if you never do these forms, if, we don't, if you go home now, okay, if you just do this every day, you're ahead of a lot of the people that call themselves business people. You should start the morning by how much cash do I have? Who owes me money? And why haven't they paid it? If you start the morning that way, your chances of success are probably like 80% greater than a lot of people because the number of people that don't have any idea, and those of you who suffer with my mentoring or coaching know when, at some time I get around to how much cash is in the bank because that, knows, that tells us from a military standpoint how much ammunition we've got to shoot. No ammo and we better start running. Um, who, who, and I don't like to run, that's why I went in submarines. The, um, um, who owes me money, okay, is important because everybody else and his brother might be sh shepherding their cash at your expense. Um, the other rule, and we won't go into collecting receivables as Americans call it, is the cheapest form of credit is not paying your own bills. Um, I, I believe there was once a very famous MP in, in Parliament that actually said back when he was an entrepreneur, he, he floated the guys, that's called not paying the bills, and those the small guys were easy. And that's often the case to you small guys, is the big guys will, will float you mercilessly because they know. So you have to stay on it, and you have to make sure that they know that you know they're a day late. And if it's two days late, shame on you. So there's a discipline, if you have kids or dogs, this is keeping them on a short lead so they know who's in trouble, in, ch in charge, sorry. They're in trouble, that was Freudian. And then why haven't they paid? There's two reasons. One is they're floating you. They don't want to go to the bank. They've decided not to pay you. The other could be they're about to go in the toilet. Um, one of my, my guys, and maybe two, um, sell to a, um, a, um, a mill that is, has a retail facility on the Isle of Man whose parent seems to be in, as the British would say, a sticky wicket. And um, so that tells everybody that maybe you should make sure that they stay current. Um, if they haven't paid, you need to find out if their parents gone bust, right? Or they've had a fire, or someone's died. So who owes me, but why haven't they paid me, right? So you gotta stay with it. So from the standpoint of a startup, and this is actually what we're here to talk about the most, if you're gonna predict what's gonna happen and you've never done it before, how do you start? And so this is probably not obvious, but at the time I did it, I thought it was clever. Below is a snapshot of the star startup's cash forecasting challenge, because that's what they start with, nothing. If, if you are trying to do anything else in life, it's always based on experience. So the number of times I've had people say, Bransom, I don't know if I'm gonna sell anything, and I don't know what it costs, so how do I forecast? And this is where the second year you have an advantage, and General Motors has an advantage. Um, They've got years of experience, and they can just extrapolate, continue drawing the line. And if you assume it's going to be the same as last year, like everybody did about 2020, and the, and the year is the same as every other year, you're fine. But then March 15th comes around 2020, and everything's out to lunch, just like it happens in a startup's cash flow. So the cash flow, and as I tell everybody, and this is where the... Um, the business about it's a um, projection, I gotta get it right, not a promise, is because it's all down to the assumptions, okay? You can actually not have a wrong cash flow, and hopefully the guys that have worked with me, I will tell you, if you can just tell me how you got there and we can substantiate it, we'll go with it, right? So then a lot of people come back and say, well, I, I, I never make assumptions. I, 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 so the, what I always say is, okay, my, my wife is from Argentina, um, and so you've got an American and an Argentine living in pool bash. That sounds like a formula for disaster, doesn't it? Anyway, um, and she does a really mean barbecue. The Argentines have a very unique way of doing barbecues. It's very methodical, artistic. Americans speaking, as I did with the first and only barbecue, pile of charcoal, 
the whole can of lighter fluid, stand back a safe distance. I was in submarines, I'm safety conscious. Throw it in the middle, boom, there's a flame. I went into Miriam and said, we're ready to cook. She said, you can't cook because there are flames. I said, there's, shouldn't there be flames if we're having a barbecue? Anyway, w I just never did a barbecue again. And she, did, I, anyway, so it's special. So let's just say I called you up and you're in Ramsey and I live down in Pool Vash, which is on the bay opposite Port St. Mary. Um, and, I, and it's 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and I said, Miriam has invited 10 people over. Two aren't coming. When could you be down here to join us? You might immediately say, what I would say is an hour, because an hour is pretty safe. Like 50 minutes if you go over the mountain road and you don't get behind somebody who doesn't realize. Anyway, I, I suffer also from a mild sometimes um, frustration in traffic. <clears throat> But in actual fact, when you said that hour or 50 minutes, okay, there were some assumptions. And when I say this to them, they, they, they don't believe it. And I said, okay, well, is it still an hour if you're going on a horse? Well, no, I'm going on a car. Oh, you're assuming that you're going to go on a car. Bingo, right? So then, um, well, how are you going to get the car started? Well, I'm just going to put the key. But what happens if you can't find the key? It's like I couldn't tonight, okay? Well, that's going to add five or ten minutes and probably some very unchristian language, right? Uh, um, what happens if when you find the key, you stick the key in, turn it, and it doesn't do nothing, right? If you're lucky, you've got another car to jump into, but if you don't, you're stuck. What happens if you have a flat tire on the way, or the bane of my existence is a farm tractor where the guy driving it seems to think that his masculinity is measured by the tailback that he accumulates and drives past every... See, I do suffer from road rage goes by every possible lay-by where he could be a good citizen and let me go by, right? And finally, what happens if you get lost? Still comfortable with the hour, right? But when you told me that it was only 50 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour, you said that like it was gospel truth, right? So if I just said, well, what does that assume? Well, it assumes I'm traveling in a normal automobile that for the keys for which I can find. It starts when it's asked to. The tires are in good shape and stay that way until I get there, or at least until I can make it all the way on the rims. Um, <clears throat> the farmers aren't working today, which I've noticed in the Isle of Man, they're always working. They're incredibly industrious. Um, and, it, and I won't get lost because I've got a GPS. Now, I know if you ask anybody about finding a place in this end of the island with a GPS, that alone means you're not coming tonight, right? <laughs> okay. So is everybody comfortable that we, we work with assumptions all the time, right? Okay. So what you do do is you start with what you know, okay? And what you know is your nut, okay? Now, this is not a reference to your partner or husband or wife, although they may be a nut. Um, I refer, and that's for you to determine, I will not opine, despite the fact there are two friend, lawyers who are friends of mine here, it's just not worth it, okay? Um, usually I use, and it's not uncommon to use, your nut is what it costs to stay in business. There is a nut associated with this place that if nobody turns up for work, if the owners of this place don't want to lose it, they have to pay basic things like heating and lighting, basic maintenance, taxes and insurance. Those are the things you can count on. So the next thing I say after we go through the assumption drill is, are you telling me you don't know what the electricity is going to cost? And what do you think the phone's going to cost? And if they say, I don't know, well, then just put in the base cost and then we'll work backwards, remember that concept, to how much we put in once we get going. So hopefully, I know I can't ask you, because, um, but um, hopefully you understand what the nut is. So we've already got two breakthroughs. If we accept that we, we just need assumptions and list them. And by the way, when you do this, on this sheet, you should list the assumptions. This assumes no COVID. This assumes no farm tractor. This assumes that I can get pizza dough at whatever it is per whatever it is, okay? Then you go down to your nut. And this is, as a minimum, if I'm in business, I'm going to have to pay the rent, I'm going to have to pay insurance, even, even if I don't open my doors. So we're pretty far down that pretty complex looking thing that's in your seat, and, and we haven't gotten down to nitty gritty yet, and you said it was impossible, okay? So then we, this is something I learned and I've used, and th this week I had somebody present it in exactly the form I've always looked for, it, the diary. Because I never quite figured out how come people couldn't figure out how many sales they're going to have in the month or how much cost they're going to have in the month. And then I realized that on top of a normal um, Excel spreadsheet, if you just put a diary for each month of what's going on, and you'll see one there when we come to it, you can say, I opened this month, I started this campaign this month, 
I paid taxes this month, TT happens this month, and then you can trickle down as you project and say, well, I might have sold 10,000 the month before, but it's TT this month, so it's gonna be at least half because the whole world dies on the island for two months, effective, uh, two, two weeks during the, around May. Do you see what I mean? So that diary alone tells you things to think about. <clears throat> then there might be a new marketing initiative you're gonna start. The first three months you go quiet, but I'm gonna start a marketing initiative. I'm gonna hire more employees. Put that in the, in, right at the top of your Excel spreadsheet, and it tells you what's gonna govern what happens in that month. So then when you try to figure out what the sales are gonna be, um, and, and you're trying to say what will I have to sell, you have to start with what will I have to sell that month and you've never been anywhere close to a business school or a Harvard Business School case study which you live on in business school without talking about widgets. I didn't realize how widgets are sort of a foreign language until my wife who is, actually she's an accountant, um, but she's Argentine and she likes to um, do upholstery. So she said, what's a widget? And I said, Miriam, just trust me. We've got big ones, medium ones, little ones and we service them and there's the price. Could you please do the Excel spreadsheet because I forgot how to work Excel. That was last night at my house and you could have heard it in Port St. Mary's. <clears throat> ended, by the way, with my wife saying, we have communication trouble sometimes, yes, <clears throat> and it's usually my fault. So this is the result I was talking about, and that's in your, but on the first page at the very top, what we're put here is, here's what we have to sell. So we list every one of our products. A lawyer could say this is a divorce, this is a transfer of title. A, a, um, an automotive business could say that it, it's an oil change or whatever. Here's what we're gonna sell it for, here's what we bought it for, here's what's happening during those particular months, and as you can see, this business is starting up, and prudently it's saying, we're not gonna do a lot the first month. If I was looking at this for the government in that role, and there was anything other than zero, you gotta talk to me about what's up here in the way of marketing that's actually coming in. So you see, it's really easy, because here, he, here they have the um, begin trading, and there's a grand opening, so there'll be an expense with that. The lights come on here, um, we realize that there's been a backlog because there's never been a XYZ tool guy on the island. There's always only been Snap-on. And we've suddenly tapped into something we never expected before. So there's a blip up. Do you see what I mean? Christmas. Got a, I don't care whether you believe or not, the world shuts down, particularly in the UK, for two weeks at Christmas. Okay? If you don't put that in your diary and plan for it in your sales and what you can even purchase, because some stuff doesn't get... So it'll affect it all the way down. So when, so when I talk about the diary that goes on top of the normal spreadsheet you see, the normal spreadsheet, again, which is the numbers on the next page, any accountant can do. The genius, the energy, is you telling them what you think is gonna be happening either that you cause or is gonna happen to you. And once you state that, then we can talk about this and we don't have to talk about the numbers. If, if sales drop by 50% in May, if we go up to the top of your diary, we can see, well, that's because of TT. So then we might say, well, it's TT, what can we sell during TT? And the common word is we'll pivot and we'll go from fire hoses to hot dogs. And so we're gonna sell hot dogs up at the, at the, the start where they're getting the new board, but I can't remember what that's called, okay? So that's the diary and that was the second sort of revelation to me sit down and do 12 months, the government for their program, and I like three years projection. So the second year starts to be fantasy and the third year is complete fantasy, but you have a way that you know you can get there, okay? It's just like a voyage plan leaving um, Birkenhead and going to Bayonne, New Jersey. How many miles, how fast will the ship go? How many bad storms do we think is gonna happen? Put in a fudge for a fire or two uh, and a storm or two, and then you just monitor it, okay? And the door is starting to open, so. <clears throat> um, now, inevitably, and people worry about this in advance, but if you just plunk in what you think is gonna happen based on your diary, you may get down to the bottom and you'll see at the bottom, because the bottom measure is cash position at the end of the month, you'll see on the really complex form. Has everybody, anybody not heard of trading insolvently? Any directors found that they were and spent time in Jerby and thank the Lord that there's a new prison? Um, because you will go to jail if you knowingly participate as a director or should have known that they were trading insolvently, which means they were contracting with trusting souls for cider or tuba, tubas or ice cream or pizzas when they knew they couldn't pay for it. 
because if there's an implied, when you order something, there's an implied warranty that you can pay for it. And if you know you don't have money on the day, and there are two lawyers here who can clarify it, but practically speaking, you've misrepresented in, in the courts, you're going to jail for fraud, just like people go down for um, tax evasion with intent. And they'll, they'll demonstrate the intent or the indiscretion. Directors are assumed to be paying attention, okay? So anyway, when you get to the bottom, you'll find, sometimes you'll find you're, you're short of cash. And this is what, um, those of you who have, as I say, suffered through my mentoring with the government program, the first thing I do is I go right along the bottom and I look to see cash on hand at the end of the month. And the whole idea to keep you out of the, the wonderful facility that is Jerby is this needs to be positive. The re, um, it may be go negative later, but if this, is, uh, if this is negative as you project, you have just demonstrated that you intended to defraud because you knew you couldn't pay your bills. Does everybody understand that? So the first test of all this, and by the way, embedded in this, if you don't use Excel, you should learn because embedded in each one of these is a program and it's pulling numbers from stuff you've put up above and you can test like I sell double the number of big widgets and you just go right down here and this number will change and that tells you how sensitive the cash is to widgets and that's called a buzzword for the MBA sensitivity analysis but Excel is great like that you can all at once say well what happens if we have COVID and we crater for two months so suddenly, we'll put zero sales in in this projection for March and April next year. Ooh, looks bad there, but like this year, we're gonna program that we came back with a totally different product and we'll actually be better off. So there'll be one projection that says with COVID and there'll be one projection without. Do you see what I mean? But they'll both look like this in form, but it'll have different numbers at the bottom. But this is the test. So here you can see we've got negatives, and back on the previous sheet, <clears throat> that either means that you weren't making money on what you were selling, or your nut was too big. In other words, these are the costs. So in your projection, you say, well, if I'm gonna do this, I have to either decrease my costs, make more money out of my sales, in other words, get them on better terms, sell on a higher price, or I'm gonna have to sell more. And by the way, <clears throat> if anybody ever sell tells you that you're going to get out of the woods selling on volume, even though you're selling at a loss, you know they really haven't been there or they haven't been there very long because if every time you sell a widget, you're losing a pound, you can sell a million of them, but you're going in the toilet or whatever you prefer to go into, as I will if I last about seven more minutes. So, <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> the other thing that's important and goes forward is, and uh, although I'm proud to be working through this program at Moore Stevens and they have a whole program dedicated to small business, um, Sometimes it's very hard to get an accountant to agree that they should produce a comparison to that projection you did every stinking, lousy, month-like clockwork. And they should be able to do it within 10 days of the next month. Because, as I always say, God only gives us 11 months in which to evaluate the year. And if you do it on a quarterly basis, as a lot of accountants try to get you to do, you only get two chances to see how you're doing. Does that sort of make sense? And the way you do it is you have a forecast and the, the accountant or you put, put together and there's a sample in there. It, forecast was 1,000. The actual for that month was 1,200. That's a positive variance and, not the up, uh, and in the income side, that's good. A negative variance is bad and it flips down below, but you can see what I mean. If we had forecast um, 1,000 and only 900 came in, how much would variance would that be in which way? Forecast 1,000 and only 900 came in. Minus 100, yeah. So, that's a, so you'd say that's a, a, a negative variance, a positive variance. <clears throat> By the 10th of the following month, every month, and as I said, the, the one thing I say um, th uh, is Coca-Cola used to have the rule, and we know Coca-Cola is not in many places, but, um, and they were run from what back then was one of the most parochial cities on the face of the earth, Atlanta, Georgia. The rule supposedly was, I don't care where you are, within 48 hours of the ending of your month, your numbers are into Atlanta. So if you're in some obscure place, don't go tell in Atlanta it's because you're in some obscure place. You will produce your numbers for Coke for Atlanta in 48 hours. X, Y, Z, whatever in the Isle of Man can get their accountant to do it in 10. So <clears throat> here it is. Um, in this case, um, here's the comparison for October. 
Um, we had 10,000 in the bank at the start. Um, th this is the cash receipts section, okay? Cash comes in, cash is paid out, and that is a cash flow laid out. And what you see in the sheet there is that just repeated for 12 months. But this, in this month, it's happened, and we can look and see, oh, sales were 50. We only had um, zero forecast, so that's a positive variance. That will translate to a better position down below, but when we looked at it, we, we recognized that we had a negative, so we had a problem here. So you can go back up through the variances and see where the problem is, and, it, and it, if you look, sales wasn't a problem because we had a positive variance, right? The problem was in the cost, yeah? So, I don't think I'm going to go in the toilet. Um, the, <laughs> um, the bottom line is, okay, in the, and I read, lifted this quote from somewhere with a forecast, there's only one thing you can be absolutely certain of, and that is that it will never be 100% accurate. This is very similar to, and it's variously attributed to um, either Hoover or Guinness about the unpredictability of a marketing budget. And whoever it was said, we know that 50% of our marketing is dollars, pounds, whatever, is wasted, but we just don't know which half, if you think about it. So we know it's gone, but we don't know where it went. So the way you deal with that is setting up assumptions for the marketing program and measuring it and doing budget to actual analysis and know that you're factored in an assumption of a 50% loss. That's why I said at the start, assumptions are everything and it's, it's a, not a promise, it's a projection. The assumptions are what are key. So, just get on with it. It's a projection, not a promise. I just heard it lock, so we're okay. So. Hello. Thank you, uh, Branson. Uh, we've now got a few minutes for question and answers. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, I should have said, if you enter your question into the YouTube um, chat uh, facility, we'll try to include your question here too. So any questions for Branson, please, uh, Mike, please wait till the mic comes to you because uh, that will help our online viewers um, to be able to hear your question as well. Thank you. There's one in the front. Thank you very much for that. It was uh, very informative. What advice would you give to any entrepreneurs uh, in terms of setup when I know for a fact that just trying to set up a bank account uh, is a bit of an issue? Oh, that was very British. <laughs> um, most of the people that I work with through the government program would not say a bit of an issue. Um, they would be far less polite. So, so what you're saying is, um, how much of a setback is it if you d can't get the bank account? Or did I understand? How much time? Sorry, how, how much time do you think somebody ought to allow in terms of setting up a business? On the Isle of Man, a business bank yeah. account or the setting up the business? Setting up the business in total. Cause, cause I, so for instance, an example would be if you were going to set up a shop, you've obviously got to find the premises, go through the lease, the legals, You've then also got to think about what, how you're going to stock it, but then also you've obviously got the issue, like I said, of, of getting a bank account to be able to do that. Well, that's it. If you do project management, that's right in the middle of the critical path, the bank account. Because it's, it, as far as the bank account, I always tell the guys and those that are here, well, it can take two weeks if you stay on it, which presumes you're down there in person rattling chains, which probably implies, I'm sorry, you're not a millennial because they just don't do that. But as an entrepreneur, we know we got to go down there and get to the bottom line. Up to I've seen it take 90 days on the bank account. To answer the other question is that's basic project management, which leads into this, and that is what are the steps to setting it up. So you break that out and say, I, I want premises that look like this. Is this the premises? I contract for the premises. Um, the lawyers can talk to you about, depending on whether you're buying it or renting it, how long it takes to process the, the paperwork. Um, for the benefit of the lawyers, do you want to raise your hand so when people come running, there's one down front and there's one, there was one in the back. Okay, 
that will be a factor in the process. And then you have to sit down and say, what do you want to put into it? I'm working with one of my guys now on new premises, and the, the one we looked at before was falling to bits, and this one is new, so the plans get out, thrown out, and we start again, and it all starts with we move in tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's hard, borderline impossible to answer that without a case in point. But you can find that out by doing the, the same detail back in the diary, saying find, well, first define premises, find premises, acquire premises, inhabit premises, fit out premises, and then in, in the, and underneath you'll start to see that, well, I need to start put a cost down for the fit out, a cost. So I don't know. But if you go into premises like this, it's probably, it takes more time for the legal work than to go in. Um, if you're building from and have to do all kinds of technological things, it could be two years. I didn't mean to evade, but maybe by talking about the variance, I answered the question. Any other questions? There's one here. I, I worked for a manufacturing company right. that got into problems. And when we invested in a new accountant, Remember, I'm not an accountant. Yeah. He insists. I'm not a lawyer either. Yeah, okay. Or a banker. Anyway, yes, a new accountant. He insisted on doing a monthly stock take. Can you tell me what, what the rationale is behind that? I've never understood it. Right. Well, um, now, that's interesting because <clears throat> one of my first jobs when I managed to get out of Purdue with a degree and a commission in the Navy was I was a supply officer on a big ship and I had 66,000 line items on board that ship. And some of that stuff I was accountable for because it made big cities go boom, maybe. Um, so we had, I, had to have the <laughs> I had to have the right parts, right? And although at that group, I, I had to have absolute accuracy. So there, one reason to a stock take, and, the, and what that would manifest if I was on the board, is somebody doesn't believe that the purchasing is being there's a lot of waste, chaos, loss in, in the purchasing. If they don't have a purchase order system, he, he's testing to see if maybe they should have one. You're also thinking of shrinkage, like you'll get to the point of who has the keys to that storage area. He's also thinking about how are we accounting for in the sale. To every time we sell, does the back office know? But the only way to, to get there is by starting with just like the cash, we started with this number of widgets. We ended up with this number of widgets. We had none come in, so the difference had better be, turn up in sales. So that's why. They can back off that once they feel comfortable and, and go out to a quarterly or even annually. But the monthly is because somebody's panicking that there's a lot of stuff either going out the back door. Um, I, I, I help people sometimes. I've, I've had two instances of I, ISO 9001 putting that in to a business. And one of the things that they often encourage you to do is to do a purchase order system. And, and um, I have known tales of entities that the first week they found 10,000 in double pays because they twice paid for the same items that came across the loading dock because they didn't recognize it came across the loading dock. And the only way they would have ca caught that is to go back for the month. Well, I had this number of widgets. 10 supposedly came in. How come I don't have 10 more and I didn't sell any? And so that, that's the reason. Yeah? And that has a tremendous effect on cash flow because if you're saying that you're, every time you make a widget, you're going to have um, two sub-widgets in it. If, if, you're, if you're using three widgets and you don't know it, your costing's wrong, so that's another benefit. But it's, it's a benchmark, and then you get the systems in to control that, and then you go, in my experience. And yeah. um, we have a question from Charlotte online. She's asking, could you explain a bit more about how it's possible to go bankrupt during a high period of high profit? Um, because, I, what, in the word, because profit is not, um, I should look there, shouldn't I? Um, Charlotte? Um, uh, profit is not cash. Profit is the difference between what you've recognized as income and what you have uh, um, paid for that, but maybe you didn't pay cash. For example, you might say, if you give somebody 30 days of credit, um, you've given up 
the goods, you've paid for the goods, and they have the goods as they get on the plane to Pango Pango, never to return, um, and they haven't paid you. So you had the sale, um, so on paper you had the profit, but there's a case where you're not gonna have the cash to pay because they didn't pay. If, if you have good controls over cash, profit is cash, but if you're doing the cruel system of, of accounting, that can happen, or if you're giving credit terms, just like the situation the gentleman asked about um, uh, inventory, if you're not keeping track of what people are paying you, you'll suddenly find you've been selling like hotcakes and you go bankrupt. That's why the second question, who owes me money? And, and people will float you unless you kick them in the shins. I'm sorry, I remember, I know I said I was a Christian coach, but there are broken toes de dealing with receivables because I'm telling you, people will float you sometimes just as, I was one time shocked, I have a, a good friend in Boston, Massachusetts, not Lincolnshire, um, and, oh, Shire, Shire, Shire. Um, anyway, um, and I was astounded to find that a law firm of 50 lawyers has a bad debt allowance of 12%, 12%, and I said to him, how on earth, I mean, you've got all this free legal talent, discounting the fact that they're supposed to be doing billable hours, are you telling me there are people who are out there will actually not pay a lawyer? And as the two lawyers here may or may not agree, many times they have to go chase it, and many times, even as lawyers, they can't get paid. So they had a sale, they did the work, Charlotte, they didn't get paid. So they had the profit on paper, if, particularly if they're accruing, but they went bust. And also, when you're selling fast, your actual sales, sometimes you start getting ahead of yourself in buying inventory. So you've bought all this inventory to deal with the lag time to produce, and you'd probably know about this coming from manufacturing, and suddenly you bought all this, but you're not making the sales to pay for it. And that's when you're crawling into your bank or to your VC saying, I tell you, I got these contracts. Give me 75% of the contracts in cash so I can make them and earn it. So hopefully, Charlotte, that was your answer. Thank you. Is there Thank anybody you. else in the room who'd like to ask a question? Um, you said they're about kicking them in the shins. You know, you can... Uh, With all due respect, yeah, right? Um, you can I have a British passport, so I learned that. <laughs> you can make a sale, you can deliver a product or a service, you can have a signed contract, and somebody decides not to pay because you are a small enterprise that they feel they can take advantage of. What do you do in that position? How, how do you approach that? How do you not end up with a what reputation is, that you can be What does the shin over. kick really look like? Yeah. Um, first, it's stating clearly up front um, when you expect to get paid. So this is where, business for my lawyer friends, you have a good solid set of terms and conditions. So I'm gonna do this, if I do this, you're gonna pay me this, sign. So that's, that's a legal document that shows he wanted it, you promised to give it, and he promised to pay. So if you do a lot of deals on a wink and a nod or a handshake, uh, the contract's enforceable, but good luck trying to perfect the judgment, okay? So the first step is to nail them down clearly. And it's also, if you wanna worry about the reputation, when somebody gets into this argument, it's less likely if it was all in writing in the T's and C's. So down at the bottom when it says payment is due on uh, receipt of invoice, pay payment is due in stages like in construction, payment is due within 30 days after, Back in the days of high uh, interest rates, they used to say pay in 10 and um, there's a discount, pay in 30 and it's face value. There used to be 210 net 30 was what it would say. So now you've got clarity up front and so that lessens the chance of any altercation. And you're right, any altercation, even if you're right, is bad for your image, okay? So then deliver it on time and when you send them the invoice, send the invoice immediately. Um, I remember a plumber on the island that I dealt with, and I always laughed to my wife. The minute they finished the job, I said, as the car, as the truck went down the road, and I watched them go to the bottom of Fisher's Hill, the postman came, and there was the invoice. Okay, wasn't true, but it was close. So you can always tell the successful business person because the invoice goes out immediately. The longer between that, they this is a selling thing. I do talks on selling, but they don't feel the fulfillment still, right? So. They suddenly think, the other thing that it communicates wrongly is you don't care. And that goes back to the little dog on the, 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 the lead or the child who 
I know you can't spank them anymore, but I sure got spanked a lot 60 years ago. <laughs> um, you, you see what I mean? So they, they learn a discipline. They learn to expect to pay. Then <clears throat> you follow up immediately when they should have paid and they haven't. Don't let a day go by. Just call and say, hi, there must be some mistake. Now, again, I know for millennials, that's hard. Shouldn't we text them first? Surely we shouldn't we do them a text on WhatsApp? No. Get on the phone, and it hurts millennials. It's funny, I, I say that. I've, I've had several work with me, and it's funny the way we go past each other because when I was selling office buildings, everything was done on the phone to get an appointment and nothing more because we wanted to be in front of people. So when you get on the phone, that you can hear that they got troubles. I mean, if you hear in the background, hey, Joe, the receiver's here, right? <laughs> that isn't going to come through on an email, right? There are, there are more subtle and less dramatic things, but you see what I mean. And then you stay on it, and you make them commit to a payment. When can I expect it? And the minute they don't deliver, just like a child, you go right back out, and they know that they're on the lead. So um, I work a lot in super yachts and write about security for super yachts, and you don't, have, you don't want the, the absolute impregnable super yacht. You just want, want one that looks harder than the boats on either side, right? So they'll go do that. So if you're known as a tight credit person but fair, you'll always get paid. When I used to work in real estate, I had to make a 250, this is 30 years ago, I had to make a $250,000 cash payment, um, payroll every month. And um, I would um, sit with the treasurer and we didn't have enough money to pay it all. I mean, we, we weren't in the fraud yet. I wouldn't admit it anyway, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I would say, who, who, who's the squeaking wheel? Well, they never complain. Great, we're not paying them this month. You see what I mean? So if they notice that they can get away with it, and it can all be very personal, and they don't even realize they're getting kicked in the shin. Well, I hear the hatch starting to open again, so I'll... <laughs> As long as you stand here, I feel comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, out of time, uh, but thanks, Branson. That's been very fast-paced, very inf uh, informative. Uh, we've really enjoyed Pleasure. the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Just a few words to close. Um, we will email you shortly with a feedback survey. Please complete it uh, with any ideas um, of what's worked, what you think we could do even better. Um, that will help us uh, be ready for our next event, which is in about a month's time. It's called Dare to be Different, How to Disrupt, Innovate and Think Differently to Win. And uh, that's being delivered by our very own island's maverick maker, Carol Glover, here at Babbage's. There's more information on our website, uh, and uh, you can also find that on our Facebook page. Uh, not only come, but please bring your friends. Babbage's uh, Bistro will be open again uh, for meals beforehand. Um, remember to switch your phones back on. Thank you that none went off tonight. Thank you for joining us online uh, or uh, in catch-up. We hope you'll join us next month too. And if I could make one final request, please, to leave the site quietly. Thank you very much for coming.